Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Do you know what the biggest blessing you can have in your life really is? Well, it's probably not what you're thinking. So stay with us. Okay, Lord, we thank you for this word today and thank you that everybody's going to learn and grow and change and we're going to be better equipped to get out in this world and serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We started talking last night about being an imitator of God. Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of God, copy him and follow his example. Now, we need to think about that. You know, it really makes us proud if we see our children imitating us. And uh, the younger they are, sometimes the more it kind of tickles us. You know, we've got a one-year-old grandson, and we spend a lot of time trying to get him to imitate us, and anytime he does, we just get really excited. So our job as Christians is not just to be saved and go to heaven. <laughs> When all this is over here, we've got our nice little mansion that Jesus is working on. And that's good news, but it's about more than that. Being a Christian is about more than just a weekly trip to church. It's about more than coming to a Joyce Meyer conference once a year. Or even reading your Bible daily. Or praying for your needs to be met. Being a Christian is really about learning how to have Jesus reproduced in you because you are now his hands and feet, his body. We are the body of Christ. What does that mean? That means that he is living in and through us. There are people that you work with that need Christ and you may be the only Jesus that they'll ever see. There are people that live in your neighborhood that need to know that God is real because they've been burned by religion, and you may be the only chance that they have of seeing a genuine, real Christian. Amen? I say this all the time, but I'll keep saying it. We need more than a bumper sticker and a cross hanging around our neck and a little bit of Christian lingo that we've all learned from going to church together. We need fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Jesus said, I say what I hear the Father say. I do what I see the Father do. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he came as a direct representative of his heavenly Father. And when he ascended on high, he sent the Holy Spirit to not only be with us, but to be in us, to empower us and enable us to be witnesses, not just to do something, but to be something. You see, when you are something, then you're spared the agony of trying to do something. I don't want to just put on a show for my Christian friends on Sunday. I want to be the same on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as I am on Sunday. I just want to be a Christian. Be. Acts 1.8 says, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power to be witnesses, to be witnesses. As I said last night, the world is desperate and we need to be preaching to them and sharing our testimony with them. And, and I said, but don't panic because I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, I'm just not good at this witnessing thing. I don't know what to say. You know what? I want you to learn to go out every day and preach a sermon and only use words when you absolutely have to. We've done enough preaching and not enough showing. We need to show people something. So, I said last night that everything that God gives to us, and there's so much, He wants it to go through us to reach other people. If you don't get that understanding, you're going to miss the whole point that God's trying to 
to make by saving you. If you didn't have a job here, he would just save you and beam you up, get you out of here. He left you here, yes, to enjoy life, but for a lot more than that, so you can be his hands and feet in the earth, so you can be his eyes, you can be his voice, you can show the love to people that they need, you can show the mercy, you can show the kindness, you can give the help. Everything from God is to us and through us. Genesis 12, 1 and 2, God said to Abraham, if you'll obey me and do what I'm asking you to do, I will bless you, I will make your name famous, I will give you an abundant increase of, fa of, of uh, favor, I'll make you wealthy. He promised him all kinds of stuff. He said, and I will make you a blessing. You know, the biggest blessing that you can have in your life or that I can have in my life is to become a blessing to someone else. It's not enough to just be blessed. I'm trying to provoke people this weekend and then all the millions that will watch this by TV around the world. I'm trying to provoke you to take another step, to go higher, to go deeper and say, it's got to go beyond just me. I want to become the voice of Jesus. I want to become his hands and feet. I want to become his eyes. I want what he's done for me to flow through me to other people. So we have to study God. We have to study the character of God. And we see the promises that God has made to us. In Isaiah 54, 17, a most amazing scripture, if we could get that up on the, the screen, we won't have to have everybody go and look it up. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. Now, we all love that scripture, but that's only the first half of it. And Dave brought up something last night when we left, because I shared a lot on this scripture. He, he said, did you notice that it says, you shall show them to be in the wrong? It doesn't say God will do it. It says, no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper, and you shall show them to be in the wrong. How do you show them to be in the wrong? Let's look at the last part of this. This peace, righteousness, security, and triumph over opposition is the heritage or the inheritance of the servant of the Lord. And who is a servant of the Lord? Those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord, which is Jesus, is reproduced. <laughs> Wow. So, I don't get the first half of that scripture if I'm not working toward the second half. And when people judge me and criticize me and their words become a weapon against me, how can I prove them to be in the wrong? I don't go try to talk them into believing what a nice person I am. <laughs> what I do is just let Jesus be reproduced in me because no matter what people try to argue with, they just cannot argue with fruit. I mean, it is very difficult to say this is not an apple tree if it is producing apples. <laughs> it is very hard to say you are not a peach tree. Do not tell me you're a peach tree because I do not believe that you are a peach tree if day after day it is producing peaches. <laughs> and it is very difficult for people to say you are just a phony. I don't believe in your phony religion. You're no different than anybody else in the world. I don't want to hear about this God of yours. I don't want to hear about your Christianity. If day after day after day after day, you are just producing godly fruit and godly character. If day after day after day, there's peace and joy and love and goodness and kindness and meekness and gentleness and humility and power. What do you, I mean, what? What's the whole world after? Power. Do you know how many people are alive today that would love to just get through this day and be stable, have control over their emotions? Do you know how many billions of dollars is spent on medication and counseling just to try to help people be level in their emotions? <laughs> and yet God gives you the power to be stable. Psalm 91.1, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable. I'm not emotional wreck anymore because I spend time with God every day. 
I'm not controlled by my circumstances because I spend time with God every day. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty whose power no foe can come against. Amen? So there's a lot of different aspects to God's character. If we're going to imitate Him, we have to know Him. We know that God is good. Yeah, all the time. So guess what that means? We need to be good to other people. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I thought I only had to act right on Sunday morning. Uh-oh. Good to people all the time. See, to us and through us. Yeah, God is good all the time to us. Now, we need to be good to other people all the time. Doesn't matter how you feel. Doesn't matter what's going on in your own personal life. All the time. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have a bad day and take it out on you? But this morning, I want to talk to you about how God is a God of justice. I've learned an awful lot about justice in the last four or five years, and I must say that it's been really a life-changing thing for me. God has a lot to say about justice, and I think the fact that He's a God of justice is really one of the most beautiful aspects of His character, because simply put, what that means is God makes wrong things right. That's what justice is. God brings justice into our life, and that means that He really won't let somebody mistreat you and get by with it. <laughs> People cannot really take advantage of you and get by with it. They can't even steal from you and get by with it. You know why? Because if somebody steals from you, if God has to take it away from them and move it through 200 people to get it back to you, it will come back to you sooner or later. But the good thing about God is when it comes back to you, it comes back multiplied. Wow. I mean, honestly, if we can ever really have a revelation on what this book is saying to us and the promises of God, man, it would be hard to keep us tied to the earth. You can't steal from me. You can't make me feel bad about myself because I know who I am in Christ. I'd like it if you like me, but if you don't, I'll survive because I know that God loves me. I don't have to be afraid of what's going on in the world today because God is with me and I already know the end of the book. You can't control my life because my life is in me. It's not what's going on around me. And that's for all of us. God is a God of justice. It simply means that He works to make wrong things right. And you can be assured this morning, those of you here and those of you watching by television or internet, if you have had something wrong done to you, you've been treated wrong at work, you're, you're somebody in authority over you has treated you wrong, a friend has told your secrets and treated you wrong, somebody's told lies about you, you can be assured that God is on the case working to make it right. Amen? Now, there are a few guidelines to getting this thing working that way. And one of them is, is if you try to vindicate yourself, then God will just stand back and say, let me know when you're finished. <laughs> so we've got to talk about a few things today. <laughs> When God justifies us with Himself, the Bible says we are justified in Christ. That means we are made right with God. So justice just means to make wrong things right. I had a lot of wrong things happen to me in my childhood, like I'm sure many of you did. I was abused by my dad sexually, physically, verbally, emotionally, told that I was no good and I'd never amount to anything. I grew up in fear, 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 fear. Everything was fear, fear. I married the first guy that came along because I thought nobody would ever want me, and he just hurt me more, ran around with other women, stole things that belonged to me so he could sell them because he didn't want to work, and just on and on and on. So the first 23 years of my life were pretty disastrous. 
And I married Dave, and Dave was a Christian. I, I had become a Christian when I was a child, but I never had any education, so I didn't know how to walk any of it out. I know God was with me. I look back now, and I know that God was with me, and that's what got me through that situation with the determination to actually do something with my life. But I needed discipling. And there's so many people in the world that need discipling. They just need a Christian to come alongside of them and help them walk through their mess. Amen? And so God sent Dave into my life, and I'm sure you've heard the funny story we tell. He was 26 years old, was wanting to get married. He was dating three girls, and he was praying for a wife. He said, God, I'm ready to get married. I lead me to the person I'm supposed to marry and make it somebody that needs help. And then after three weeks of marriage, he looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's interesting how we pray those prayers and then forget what we prayed, right? <laughs> oh, God, use me. <laughs> use me, God. And then two weeks later, we're just saying, well, I just feel like everybody just uses me. So Dave prayed that God would give him somebody that needed help, and he became an example to me. He became a living example to me. He showed me what it was like to stay peaceful in the storm. He showed me what it was like to love unconditionally. He was just there loving me. Now, most of the time, I couldn't receive it because I had all these problems in my soul, but Nonetheless, he didn't withdraw it because I didn't know what to do with it or because I didn't love him back. He just was what he was. <laughs> and see, so many of you that are married to spouses that are unsaved, most of the time it's not going to do you much good to try to convince them verbally. Matter of fact, it's really bad when you tell them and don't show them anything. Or when it's really bad if you tell them and then show them the opposite. Dave and I got married and we started going to church and that was good, you know. I took instructions in the church and was baptized in the church and took all these classes and officially became a church member and officially became a Christian and stayed miserable. Went to church all the time, stayed miserable. I had a sick soul. I had sickness in me. I had a broken heart that needed to be healed. And then as years went by, and by God's mercy, I entered into a deeper relationship with Him. I began to really study the Word, study the Word, study the Word, study the Word. And I started seeing these promises in the Word. And I started seeing things like... Isaiah 61, that he will give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. And then I saw Isaiah 61, 7 and 8. I want us to put it up on the screen because this was a huge promise to me that kept me going for a long time. Instead of your farmer's shame, you shall have a twofold recompense. A recompense is a reward or payback, compensation. Instead of your farmer's shame, you shall have a twofold recompense, or let's just say a double reward. <laughs> Instead of dishonor and reproach, your people shall rejoice in their portion, therefore in their land, not just when they go to heaven. In their land, they shall what? Possess double what they forfeited. Come on. <laughs> and everlasting joy shall be theirs. Why? For I, the Lord, love justice. <laughs> God is a God of justice. And he's like, I cannot stand it when people are treated wrong. I cannot stand the injustices that happen to children. God is angry about children all over the world starving. Well, why doesn't God do something about it? Hello? He's trying to, if he can set a fire in us. We're always praying for God to do something about something that we ought to be doing something about because He lives in us. Stop praying for God to do something that you won't be involved in.
I'll give you an example of what I think injustice is. <laughs> I heard a, per a person that I know saying that a person that she worked with uh, still didn't have a mattress for her bed, so she was sleeping on the couch. And uh, so she's praying for her to get a mattress. Now, <laughs> it was really just about all I could do to just not say, well, why haven't you just bought her one? Or why haven't you just taken one out of one of your extra bedrooms that you're not using and given her one? See, God told me a few years ago, Joyce, stop praying for me to do things that you're not willing to let me do through you if I call on you. Yeah, well, you ought to like that better than you're acting. <laughs> you're afraid to get too excited because you don't know what God might ask you. A mattress? Come on, you can live without a mattress. Justice. It's injustice for one Christian to have no mattress and another person to have six bedrooms, five of them not even being slept in, and then that person who has so much be praying for God to do something for this one. Come on, we need a fire. God is a God of justice. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Now, there are kind of rules to getting God's help, guidelines, rules, right ways, whatever you want to call them. But in other words, we don't just, we don't just get to cash in on the good stuff without doing our part. We're partners with God. Now, the good thing is, is you don't ever have to do anything on your, on your own because God gives us His power to do it. But never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So what does that mean? When somebody does you an injustice, you cannot pay them back. Because if you try to get them back, you just become like your enemy. <laughs> but if you will wait on God, trusting Him, and, everybody say and. and. While you're trusting Him, you need to be sowing seeds into somebody else's life. It's very simple. When somebody mistreats you, you wait on God. You trust God, and while you're doing that, you bless somebody else, then God brings a harvest in your life. So, I tried for years to get my dad back for abusing me by hating all men and having a rebellious attitude, and nobody's going to tell me what to do again, and, 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 and I had a chip on my shoulder, and you know, all these dysfunctional behaviors that we get when we've been mistreated. And all I got was miserable, miserable, miserable. Well, when I finally saw this, beloved, don't try to avenge yourselves. How, co how could I make my dad pay me back for what he took? He, he took something that he couldn't give me back. Only God could make it up to me. When I saw that promise in Isaiah that God would not only give me back what was taken from me as a child, but he would give me double, double honor double blessing, double recompense. Then I started realizing that I needed to stop trying to take care of myself and let God do it. You say, well, man, the waiting part is so hard. I've been waiting for five years for God to do something, and He hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> but let me ask you a question, and you got to get this part. What have you been doing while you've been waiting? <laughs> well, I've just been frustrated. Uh, yeah, and how much have you been complaining? Well, yeah, I've done a little bit of that too. <laughs> no, we need to wait on God and do good. Psalm 37, the first five verses or six verses are so powerful. We're going to get around to it in one of these lessons. But it says, trust in the Lord. Do not fret yourself over evildoers. Trust in the Lord and do good. And you will see God's reward in your life. 
So when I started, just I stopped trying to get the world back for what my dad had done to me, and I put it in God's hands. You pay me back. And I set about just trying to help other people. Before long, I tell you, the blessings just started rolling in, started rolling in, rolling in, rolling in, rolling in, rolling in, rolling in. Peace, joy, righteousness, opportunities. If you do it right. Well, the bottom line of what we want you to take away from this program today is that the better you treat people, the happier you're going to be. I love Psalm 37, three, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. When you have a problem, what do you wanna do? Number one, trust in the Lord. Number two, do good.